This content is brought to you by Scouts, the strongest Salesforce hub in the Nordics and Poland, bringing tech solutions to Danish banks. Anna, we are very happy to have you here on our conference. Hi. Awesome. It's awesome to be here. Uh, hello, everyone. I can see some people in the back. You won't see all the small slides. There are two places here, one here, one, one, three more. So please come. Yeah, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, I, I promise it will be nice. I promise it will be good. So yeah, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, and I would like to start with saying thank you. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for finding time, finding these few hours to come here to listen to all these great speakers, sharing their thoughts, sharing their ideas. Thank you to listening to me. I hope you will enjoy this presentation. I hope you will learn something. And yeah, as Dorota said uh, before, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them after my presentation. My name is Anna Wawak-Dujic, and I am currently employed at Akiva Labs as an engineering director for Central West European Department. Uh, I started my adventure as a DevOps engineer by accident, because I started my adventure with Salesforce as a developer. And it was around 12, year, 12 years ago when um, Ant... Uh, metadata tool was still a thing, and we really didn't, didn't have a good CI CD process. It was extremely frustrating experience for me. So since that moment, 12 years ago, I tried to improve how the release management looked for my customers, for my products. And by accident, I was one of a few people who had this goal. So I become a DevOps engineer in my team. And this is also what I'm doing right now. I'm working with uh, various customers to help them implement efficient, efficient release management. And I would like you to learn more about how to make good release management process. And I was thinking, how can I do that? How can I bring this whole idea, this extremely complicated topic to you? And I figure out I will take you to adventure, to another adventure similar to one I experienced before. I would like you to meet Universal Containers, company we all know and love. So Universal Containers in this particular scenario are using two products. They are using Sales Cloud for managing their B2B sales pipeline, and they are using Service Cloud for managing all the support requests coming from their customers. And what kind of Salesforce team company like Universal Containers has. So basically they have few developers, QA, admin, product owner, and so on, so on. So pretty small, standard, whole internal team. And basically they evaluated their plan, their backlog for the next months, and they discovered that they don't have enough manpower to deliver everything. So they hired a new developer. Meet Cody. Cody is joining Universal Containers this month as a new developer, and Cody wants to prioritize being hands-on. He hates reading documentation. He wants to start coding. This is what he gets paid for, and this is what he wants to do. He will be supported by Cloudy. Cloudy is an administrator for Universal Containers for more than three years now. Her personal motto is, if Mark Benioff didn't want us to do changes directly on production, why would he made it possible? So yeah, she will be supporting, she will be supporting uh, Cody in uh, creating, in onboarding to universal containers. They will be also supported by Ruth. Ruth is Salesforce architect who is overseeing the whole project and she will be supporting uh, Cloudy and Cody on Cody new adventure to universal containers. So let's start, or rather let Cody start. So what does he need to uh, you know, start coding, start delivering value for universal containers? First thing is obviously a repository. A repository is a must have for every Salesforce project. Why? Few simple reasons. First thing, you have a, um, you have a backup of your metadata. So whatever happens, whatever random changes happen on your production, you have your repository where everything hopefully works. Right? So this is a very important thing. But also, if you have a company, a team, where you have more than one developer or more than one engineer, because admins can use version control too, with the repository, you reduce the chance of 
conflicts. I mean, the conflicts would still appear, but thanks to the project repository, you can detect them easily and you can resolve the conflicts, resolve the issue much, much earlier in the, on the road rather than directly on production. Universal containers are using service cloud and the heart of service cloud is, of course, case object. We can quickly imagine, we can easily imagine a situation where three or even four members of the team are all working on some things, some changes, some updates related to case. And even with the new source-driven uh, metadata shape, we still can easily encounter conflicts when working on case with few people. So thanks to the repository, we are able to mitigate it or detect it much faster. And second thing that Cody will need to effectively start working is, of course, a development environment, because in Salesforce, you need one to work on projects. And basically, Universal Containers is a good company. So in Universal Containers, every developer has their own environment not sharing with anyone. We don't like sharing. In this particular case, we don't like sharing. Everyone, everyone has one. And yeah, one is, belongs to one. Like, please, please, okay, please, thank you, thank you. And Cody started to wonder, okay, so I, I will receive my one environment. But what type? Previously, Cody was working in a company that was using scratch cores. And he really enjoyed that because, you know, he was clicking a few things and pull new environment, beautiful solution really working out. So obviously universal containers being new, modern, and following all the standards company, right? They should also use scratch orgs. So he asks Cloudy, okay, are we using scratch orgs or do you want to provide something else for me? Cloudy explained to him that a few months ago, they made the exact like, uh, they made analysis exactly like that when they took a look at all possible solutions for development environments, and they tried to figure out what really works for them. So the first thing they started wondering about was obviously scratch orgs, and they decided to use something which is called scratch org with org shape. It means that the scratch org is based on production or on some other org, but basically on normal org. So you're some one of your sandboxes or production, and it has all the metadata, it has uh, all the additions and licenses, it's easy to create, but for some reason, it does not copy the packages. You need to install the packages manually. That was not perfect solution for universal containers because they are using a lot of external packages to, you know, have additional functionality in Salesforce. And they didn't feel like writing scripts to install all those packages and set them up. So the second option that they considered was also scratch orgs, but this time with this fancy feature called snapshot. So it means that you take a scratch org, make it a snapshot, and create another scratch org out of it. Perfect solution, it seems right. Exact replica, all metadata, all packages, all data even. Sounds great, but it does not have licenses that you want because as we know, on Scratch Orgs, it's not that we can create any Salesforce org, right? With all the licenses, with all the uh, products that we want. So because Universal Containers is using some rather exotic licenses from exotic Salesforce products, they were not able to create a good Scratch Org with a proper snapshot. And also, one more thing that, decide, that make them decide to drop this idea is that the snapshots need to be recreated every 90 days. You could say, what's the problem? I create a snapshot, and after 90 days, I make a snapshot out of it, right? Easy thing. No, it's not allowed. You cannot. You need to create a new scratch org that is not based on snapshot, absolutely from scratch, and only then you can make it a snapshot. Every 90 days. So you can do it manually, or you can write a lot of scripts to make it happen, or you can use sandboxes. Maybe it's not the most, you know, sexy term right now in the Salesforce words, but it contains all the metadata, all the licenses, all the packages. Okay, it needs to be manually refresh, and it needs to be set up with data, but at least all the important stuff, all the configuration is already there. And that's the decision that Universal Container made. 
they decided to go with sandboxes. And they decided that they will be refreshing it after every Salesforce release. So developer sandboxes will be refreshed after Salesforce releases. And also to uh, deal with the problem related to lack of testing data, they decided to use something which is called SFDX, Data Move Utility Tool, which allows you to quickly seed your environment with, uh, with the data, and you can actually do it directly from production, anonymizing on the fly. So something similar to, to, to data, data masking. Uh, so Cloudy explained all of this to Cody, and Cody started wondering, okay, so I know about the environment, I know about the repository, what else there is to know? So obviously, one of the things that developer or engineer joining a team needs to understand is the Git branching strategy that is valid for this project. So universal containers decided to stay with the standard. They decided to stay with what we, rather, what we recognize as a Git flow with one small change. Basically, every time they try to create a new feature, they do not create it from a develop branch, which is the normal custom with the Git flow. They create it from the main branch. Because of that, every feature is developed independently and you know when the release comes and when the product owner decides I want this, I want that, I hate this, they can easily make this release happen with this quick approach. Oh, Cloudy said, uh, one more thing. When you look uh, at the Git, you may sometimes see uh, some not obvious commit messages. And this is related to the fact that we are using DevOps Center. Uh, in this project. So basically DevOps Center is a product from Salesforce. It's free to use and it's supposed to replace change sets. Claudia explained that in the past she was doing a lot either on production or using change sets, which caused a lot of problems. So basically because she's not very fluent with Git, the architect suggested to start using DevOps Center. She's using it just to retrieve the changes, look at what is there, and commit to the repository so that all her changes are aligned with changes made by developers. DevOps Center is, of course, much more ambitious too, and it can be used to, for example, automatically deploy uh, changes to the next environments. But in case of universal containers, where they, when they decided to use it, they were already uh, they already had established pipeline CI/CD in GitHub Actions, so it made no sense to do it again uh, in the DevOps Center, especially because everything was working, so they are just using that uh, for the admin capabilities. So yeah, so it makes us think, why did Cloudy have to stop making changes in production? I mean, it's, it's so convenient, right? You go there, you click, and it works, your customers are happy, your users are happy, it's, 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 it's so beautiful thing, but it's actually not so beautiful thing to users even, because if you do changes directly on production, you may create bugs that are immediately blocking your users from working, not your UAT from working, not your, I don't know, QA org from working. You are blocking your production. You are introducing your changes, your bugs directly to production. Also, you don't really provide any release notes or documentation or training to the user because they are like, oh yeah, we want this new path and you create this new path and there is not much time to really prepare users because you do it, you know, directly on production. Also, it may uh, cause issues with uh, analysis time. So, you know, someone comes to you and say, yeah, I want this thing. And you are like, yeah, I can do it in 20 minutes stops. And you go on the production, you click it through, uh, and then they are like, yeah, I mean, this is, this is, this is not exactly what we wanted, you know? This is, this is not what we wanted. But it's already on the production, and people started using it. So it's kind of a problem, right? So yeah, it's, it's, it's not a good practice. And uh, also, it's dangerous to the process for, for many reasons. Uh, but basically, uh, it influences the process. You are not verifying the changes the same way that you are verifying the changes with other people, right? You don't go through the analysis. You, your team is not aware what is happening. You can actually override your changes. So this is very unsafe practice, and that's why they introduced things like uh, DevOps Center to universal containers. They, that's why in, they introduced some other processes to make sure that it's not happening. 
And basically, uh, with the new world, with the new process, it's not necessary to do things directly on production because new process is very easy. It has short lead time. So basically, when uh, Cloudy wants to do something, she verifies this with the team, she does the change on her sandbox, she uses DevOps Center to push it through the pipeline, the team review the changes, and they can deploy easily just her change, right? So this can all be easily resolved. She still keeps her independence. She's still happy. The users are happy because of the low lead time. And basically, all the problems that were caused by doing stuff directly on production are now addressed with this new process. She can, of course, still do some stuff on the production. We are still human, right? And sometimes you need to do something immediately. And also, if you don't have full production, full copy sandbox, doing reporting or dashboarding on sandbox is not a pleasant experience. So she is allowed to do some changes that do not influence the process directly on production to, yeah, again, make user happy and make her work more efficient. But... You know, we started talking about reviewing the work, so it, make, um, it made co Cody wonder, okay, how the whole review thing work? So that's where Ruth stepped in to explain how the pull request experience, how the code review experience works for universal containers. So basically, universal containers are really prioritizing static code analysis. So what they are doing is that when a new pull request is created, they are using a dedicated GitHub action to run a Salesforce code analyzer through the changed code and leave a comment directly on pull request for a person to address. So immediately after you create pull request, you have all this information available immediately. Salesforce Code Analyzer is tracking your code in terms of security, in terms of performance. So it's a really nice tool that you can actually extend with your own PMD rules. And the second thing that uh, they are using is something uh, that is called AI Checker. So this is an application that was developed internally in universal containers. And what they are doing is that they have small Heroku app that is working with the GitHub. So whenever a new pull request is created, they send the information to this Heroku app, which sends, using private API key, the information to ChatGPT with a proper uh, prompt engineered before. And then, yeah, they return again some comments about security, about stuff that maybe Code Analyzer has missed. So a lot of automatic, uh, a lot of automatic uh, static code analysis is happening so that humans can focus on checking if the engineer has translated business requirements to proper technology. Because this is something that people, that robots actually sometimes still are struggling with because of how faulty we all humans are with specifying our, our requirements. And it brings us to the topic of releases, because now when we have, you know, all the changes, the, to the question is, what about release? And Ruth said to Cody that they actually have one release coming tomorrow, and maybe he wants to, you know, call in and attend. Cody did not want to attend release. He remembered release very well from his past company when he was joining a call, and for six hours, he looked at some guy randomly typing on his monitor, on, on his keyboard, and trying to figure out why the deployment was not working. So yeah, he, he preferred to write another LWC component on, or read documentation. Roof explained that this is not actually a case for release in universal containers, where they usually take like half hour or one hour. So what they are doing, the first thing is that uh, they are using something, uh, they, are, they have the safe process when they are validating everything before it's ready to release. So in the CI CD setup, they of course validate every deployment and they also run unit tests to make sure that all the unit tests that will be run on the production org are actually passing and have enough coverage. Uh, of course, Universal Containers is quite a large organization, so one of the problems that they have experienced in the past was that when they were doing deployments, they were struggling to keep it on time, but they started using a CLI plugin called SFDX Git Delta, which basically based uh, on the difference in Git, 
So for example, difference in main right now versus the commit before the release, it creates a full catalog ready to deploy together with package XML and destructive changes if something needs to be deleted. So thanks to that, they can have these very small deployments where they deploy or delete only what was mentioned or prepared for this release. They are also using quick deploy solution from Salesforce. So basically a day before they do anything, they do the release, they go to the production, they do validation of their Delta deployment. And thanks to that, the small button appears quick deploy. So when they actually go to the call with the deployment, they just click this button and Salesforce is just committing these changes to the org. It does not run all the tests, it does not run all the deployments, so it only takes like 10, 15 minutes uh, tops. So thanks to that, releases are short, releases are efficient, and to reduce the number of potential errors, to reduce number of potential issues, they have this beautiful confluence template where they have all the manual steps, pre and post deployments, all the approvals, all the statuses, so they can track, are we prepared? for this release or not. Because Roof long ago discovered that half an hour of good communication can save you eight hours of debugging stuff that is not working on production just because someone was not informed, someone has not tested something enough, someone missed some manual steps. So they have this template in the Confluence. They, once the release is over, they just copy it, empty from the outdated stuff, and then through the release, through the next sprint, sprints, however, how, how, it doesn't matter how long this will take, they are filling this in with the manual steps, with approvals, and everything that they need to gather. And yeah, thanks to that, thanks to all of this, they are able to do what in universal containers is pushing in the same direction. Because the whole release management, the CI, CD, it's not really there to make developers' life easier. I mean, it's a byproduct, right? Like, we are happy that this is a byproduct. But the, the general assumption is that we want to have efficient and working software. No, scratch that. This is also not the goal. The goal is that we want our users to be able to deliver the value that they promised to company. Salesforce is just a tool. CI, CD is just a tool. The objective is to do whatever the company is doing. For universal containers, it's selling their product to B2B. For your companies, for your customers, it's something else. This is the goal. And Salesforce is the tool, and our CI, CD is a tool. And we need to remember that. We need to remember what is the goal and design the process to follow that. If we need to make changes directly on production, to make it more efficient, sure, let's just make a risk analysis. If we need to maybe adjust our environment strategy, let's think about the ultimate goal and make sure that whatever we figure out, we are following this approach. And if you want to learn more about it, if you want to learn more about we do, how we do stuff in universal containers, everything can be found in our company's confluence or through this uh, QR code. Because there are many plugins out there, there are many solutions out there that you can use uh, to optimize your CI CD pipeline, to optimize your release management process. And sometimes all you need to do is search and make sure that you apply uh, the new tools, or sometimes not so new tools, efficiently to your workflow. So what is left is to say thank you to the Universal Containers team for introducing us to their uh, process. And I would like to say thank you for listening to me. I counted only three people left the, uh, left the presentation when I was speaking, so I think this is maybe not my pers Oh, no, sorry, the fourth one is leaving, sorry. Yeah, not my personal record anymore. But yeah, thank you for listening. I'm available to question uh, right now for the next few minutes. I will be also walking around because I really want to uh, wait for Mateusz uh, presentation later during the day because I've heard there is, it's great, I've heard, is it? Okay, he says it is, so I will be around, so if you have any questions, please uh, let me know, and yeah, uh, in this QR code, you also have my LinkedIn, so if you want to reach out to me later with some questions, I'm also happy to, um, to, to, to do that, uh, and yeah, we're hiring for developers and QA, so please, please reach out to me. We need them immediately. Uh, I, I wanted to say, Dorota, please, uh, thank you very much. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> yeah, we warned you guys there might not be some official job fairs here, but some offers maybe during the break. Okay, do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, we do. So let me just stroll around the room and see who has their questions. Okay, so maybe we'll start with this gentleman. Okay. Uh, hi. So my first question would be about your kind of GitFlow approach, pretty mm -hmm. much. Uh, so I mean, like, first thing would be to why to keep the development branch in your scenario if you branch out of the main master branch, right? Mm -hmm. uh, second thing is the kind of a problem you have over here that if you create those feature branches from master and you have dependencies between the user stories that effectively uh, developers cannot work on the same, on the, let's say, stories that depends on the other story unless you merge them to the specific branch and then you effectively have a master branch that is affected by those changes. But if those things were not tested properly, then effectively developers don't have a branch that okay, they can use for the deployments that is that they can be certain that it's going to work. Uh, so that's the second thing. Uh, and the words, let me wait here because I and think then, I'm... I'm uh, the is last this thing, also Git flow? Is this also a good flow question? Yeah, I mean, like, related okay, to, your, to okay. your scenario. And the yeah. thing, last thing would be, I mean, like, because you mentioned that kind of change, kind of request ticket, uh, so should not business decide what they want, let's say, during or after your UIT, rather than, let's say, around the go live meeting? Okay, yeah, sure. So let's start with the first one. Why do we have develop branch? Because the assumption is uh, we usually try to plan our releases and to plan our sprints according to releases. So develop branch is a place where there is this first opportunity to merge and detect the conflicts and deploy this to QA to check if it's all working together and allow the testers to verify on one sandbox environment rather than verify on feature branches. So we are aware that develop will not be uh, uh, our release branch. We just want to have one place where we have more or less all the changes for our QAs to work on. The second question was about... Dependencies. Well, oh, yeah, dependencies yeah. between user stories. So it sometimes happens that we have few user stories and they are dependent. So there are a few options. One option is that you try to not make dependent user story, which is sometimes not possible because you have a whole scope. And if you have a dependent user stories, what you do is you do not create the feature from the main branch, you create next feature from existing feature branch. And because when you say you have independent user stories, it means that they all need to be deployed together, right? You, you cannot say, if they are so dependent, they are so dependent. So basically what we do in that uh, case, we, we, uh, we branch from, the, from like some of the feature branch that already started, and we agree that you know, whatever is the outcome feature branch, this is the final one that will be uh, merged with the release. And uh, in the terms of your last question, which was about when, do we, need, when we are deciding uh, what to merge to the, uh, to the re uh, what, what should go into the release, uh, so, it depends on the particular, of course, company, how they apply it, but uh, in my case, what I often see is that we do it after the UAT and before release. And the reason for that is UAT, if you do it with actual users, you sometimes discover that you have an issue with something. Maybe you misunderstood something, maybe it's not working as expected, and you have the whole release ready, and this one user story that is not ready, right? That you cannot deploy. So this is a moment when you basically want to create uh, a new release, kind of a new release. You want to recreate the release with all the feature branches that you know that will be going. You are doing final smoke testing, and then you are going into production. And this is the reason why uh, I mentioned that this may happen, for example, after UAT, because yeah, I experienced in my life that everything went great, and then UAT said, ah, Everything's good, this one is not. And you need to be prepared for that, and I hate cherry picking. Thank you very much. We have another question, I believe. Okay. Hello. Uh, I want to ask you about, do you have any experience with polyrepos in Salesforce? Uh, my use case in my company currently is we had a medium-sized repository with one module on leads sec and second one on accounts and contacts, let's say. and 
DevOps decided to split it into three distinct, uh, the distinct one. One is the common repo with all utilities and trigger frameworks, and the rest are these business values. And yesterday we, ha we had a deployment to UAT, and I'm very happy that I'm here today and not with them. And yeah, it, it went very bad uh, because every dev, dev repo has dependency to another one. So do you have any uh, hint how so, to handle it? So you it? split it into like packages or like repositories? Repositories, no packages, no unlock packages, just three different I, I, repos. I will, I will ask my favorite follow-up question, but why? Uh, the reasoning was that there were a lot of... Uh, issues with the code reviews and uh -huh. the conflicts before the deployment and they wanted to have it made. So now they have the conflicts and the problems why they are deploying and yeah. not before. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, so uh, to answer your question, unfortunately, I don't have much experience with uh, poly repositories. We usually have one. Uh, sometimes we are using separate packages in the uh, in the Salesforce, but to be honest, we don't have anything really fancy, so I, I will not uh, elaborate on that. Uh, my general recommendation in that case would be to really, uh, when you are saying you have DevOps team, it always rings some bells, because Salesforce DevOps is, is pretty basic stuff. Like, it's, you know, it's like, two nights with documentation, it's not very advanced. If you have dedicated team for that and it's not just your developer, you know, taking another hat, it probably means they have too much time and then trying to figure something out uh, why, why they are getting paid. Anyway, uh, we are still recorded? Okay, never mind. What I wanted to say, what I wanted to say is uh, basically uh, the problem that you explain is really a problem for large teams. I just don't think separating repository is resolving. I think maybe more efficient code review, uh, maybe automatic code review, maybe uh, using Delta deployments. Maybe it's, it's hard to say, you know, without looking at that. But to me, separating the repositories, physical separation, just means there is more places where you can encounter issue too late. Uh, if you have conflicts, separating does not resolve conflicts, like not, not this way, because after all, with Salesforce, if I want to change an account, I, I will need to change this account trigger handler, right? So it, it will happen. It's just maybe I, will, I don't want to do this in that repo, so I'm doing this in this repo, and now no one will discover it until, until the deployment. So yeah, it's hard for me to, to, to um, recommend something without like very specific knowledge about your process, but it sounds to me that someone did not ask, but why will this help? Why are we doing that strong enough? Uh, maybe this is the best solution, but yeah, a few steps were, were skipped. I don't have easy answer for you. Thanks. Good luck. <laughs> Yeah, and some uh, well-deserved applause. Do we have any other questions in the room, maybe in the back of the room? I don't think so. I don't see any hands raised. So I believe this is the end of the Q&A session. Anna, thank you so much for joining us for your thank great you presentation. Much.